Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to USIP for what I think is going to be a really uh, interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, my name is Andrew Blum. I'm a senior program officer here in the <coughs> program at USIP. Um, as <coughs> many of you know, USIP has several strands of work that are focused on Sudan. Uh, my role in that broader portfolio is to oversee our Sudan priority grant competition. The first thing I need to do today is deliver uh, some bad news. Amir Idris uh, from Fordham University, who was supposed to be one of our commenters, had something urgent arise uh, late yesterday and, and will not be able to make it. He obviously would have brought a very interesting perspective, but we hope with you know this nice crowd we'll use that time for comments and discussions and use that time productively. Um, I wanted to set a little bit of the context for what you're going to be hearing today. Um, the Sudan Priority Grant Competition has been giving grants to organizations in Sudan working on issues of peace, peace building since 2006. Um, in 2011, the decision has been made to focus our efforts uh, on the issues of the north-south border um, by launching what we're calling the north-south north border initiative. As part of that process, as part of the initiation of that program, we've asked Concordis, uh, Concordis International, along with their partners in Sudan, to conduct a conflict assessment of the border, really looking at what are the conflict dynamics being created by the border, what are the sources of instability, what are the opportunities to promote stability, to help inform us uh, within the grant program about how we can support Sudanese organizations uh, and international <laughs> organizations to help promote stability along the border. The report that we're going to talk about today is the result of the research that Concordis completed, and I'll let them talk a little bit more uh, about the research process. One of the reasons we asked Concordis to do the research is the really innovative cross-border relations work they're doing along with University of Juba uh, in Sudan at the moment. Uh, and some of that work will has fed into the research you're going to hear about today. This meeting here today uh, is in many ways a follow-up to a two-day workshop we did in Khartoum uh, that was organized by, I want to get this right, um, the National Forum for Peace and Reconciliation? For Reconciliation and Peace Building. The, the National Forum for Reconciliation and Peace Building, uh, where we brought senior level civil society and political leaders from the north, from the south, from the border areas themselves, uh, and presented and got feedback, got input on some of the research that Concordis, is, has, uh, Concordis had completed at that point. Um, we've provided the bios for the speakers, so I'm not going to go into too much uh, detail. Uh, we have Chris Milner, who is the research manager for Concordis. Uh, we have Benedetta De Alessi, who is one of the key researchers on the team that produced the research. Uh, in a moment, I will hand it over to them, and they will present. They will go through their, their key findings and talk about the research. After that, we'll have Martin Pratt from the International Boundaries Research Unit, um, an expert on boundaries and somebody who has worked uh, in and on Sudan as well uh, to comment on, on the research. After that, we'll have a good amount of time for questions, uh, discussions, and the like. Um, I will emphasize sort of right away, we have a lot of folks in the room, so when we do start with our comment period, please keep your questions and comments uh, short and to the point. Okay. Awesome. And with that, I will, uh, I will hand it over to Chris. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Well, good afternoon. My name is Chris Milner. I am the research manager with Concordis International. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to present the findings of our research project commissioned by USIP. 
I will just speak very briefly about the research process so that you know where what we are telling you today came from. Um, as Andy has said, um, I'm sorry. I've been yeah. informed that because of the cameras, we need to speak from the podium. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? I can see you at the back now. Hi, in the cheap seats there. Um, so as we've heard from Andy, the report uh, aims to identify the likely drivers of conflict that are exacerbated by dynamics related to the north-south border in Sudan. Um, we also aim to identify the geographic areas that are most likely to suffer violence um, as a result of these conflict drivers. Um, and we also aim to outline what government and civil society initiatives are taking place to assist in the management of uh, border-related tensions. So briefly, um, the report is a result of a desk research and a field research which took place uh, in mid-2010, um, June, July, and August, um, involving a team of Sudanese and international researchers. <coughs> it also involved a senior-level workshop in Khartoum organized by the National Forum on Reconciliation and Peacebuilding, as you've heard. Um, the study is also informed by uh, the Cross-Border Relations Project, um, which is a partnership between Concordis International and the Center for Peace and Development Studies at the University of Juba. Um, and in that project, we are facilitating workshops um, with local community leaders, with civil society organizations, and with local administrators um, along the north-south border. And we're asking them to think about, uh, it's an opportunity for them to think about principles and proposals um, that they think would help make a border work, would help make the border work uh, to meet their interests. Um, so here's a, here's a meeting in um, Agok, which is Abbe on the left, involving mainly Dinka Nok participants. And the right-hand photo is uh, a meeting in White Nile State in Kosti. Uh, with Al Salam and Al Hamda and other um, groups. Um, the report is not about demarcation of the north south border. Um, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement sets out a mechanism for delineating and demarcating that line. Instead, the report asks what impact national and local border related dynamics are having on communities um, living around the border region and the potential impact on wider peace in Sudan. Um, so much of the report outlines perceptions, um, perceptions uh, described by populations at the border during the field research and during the uh, Concordis CPDS workshops. Um, and these perceptions are important, as we all know. They determine human response, um, even if they don't necessarily reflect realities. Um, so Concordis International does not necessarily endorse any particular views that you will um, find represented in the report. So ultimately, um, you know, we find that national agreement on border-related dynamics and border demarcation is absolutely essential for uh, stability in the, in the borderlands and in the wider Sudan. Um, but it's not necessarily sufficient, and local actors... Um, could have the possibility to draw in um, national actors and, uh, and other interests um, into a, and to exacerbate conflict, um, just as national disagreement could generate contestation and, and, and violence in the border region. So we hope that this report will generate a greater understanding of the dynamics uh, playing out in the border areas, um, and we hope it will assist in the generation of policies and development strategies um, to respond to those conflict drivers um, so that the border can work for local communities and for national elites. I'll hand over to Benedetta, uh, who will present some of the key findings. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to present some key findings of the research. It will be first a thematic discussion, and then I will go more deeper into the 
areas, geographical areas that we have examined. Um, the major findings uh, identified after the research are three. Um, the CPA has hardened the north-south divide. The CPA has created the issue of the north-south border by defining the government of South Sudan and the issue of self-determination, but has focused on making the unity attractive instead of supporting also the option of an attractive separation. That has created a situation whereby the mistrust between the parties, the mistrust between the party has exacerbated local conflict along the border. And um, the border states are the most critical war affected areas. I will show you later the map, but we have to consider that board, we have 10 border states, five in the north and five in the south. In the ten, the, the, uh, among the five border states in the north, three of them are the transitional areas affected by the war that have not received sufficient funds. The National Reconstruction, Reconstruction Development Funds, the NRDF, didn't work as expected. The southern uh, border states are, um, <coughs> are extremely weak and lack of capacity to deal with the border dynamics. And one of the northern states is, uh, is at war, is South Darfur. So we are talking about uh, states that had no capacity to deal with, with the border dynamics and the decentralization foreseen by the CPA has not materialized. Um, and that has increased uh, mistrust as we would see during the, during the presentation. There is a great gap between local and national perception along the border, and uh, local community feels that have not received what they had been entitled or they were expecting by, by the CPA. Um, the disagreement within the presidency over the border demarcation affects, first of all, local communities. Local communities feel that they have not been consulted by the technical border committee that has gone around uh, assessing the border. And this is fueling, um, fueling mistrust and, um, and, creating, and creating local conflict, as uh, I will explain better in the area analysis. Security problems along the border are perceived as a national problem, but affecting um, communities at the local level. Uh, in the post-CPA era, we have seen a reinforcement of conflict drivers along the border. The lack of agreement within, between the parties over the um, contested area, the demarcation of the border, <coughs> um, has created exactly contested areas where SPLA and SAF troops have been deployed, and that has increased militarization. Um, along the border, in particular in the central area of Unity, ABA, and in the upper Nile Peak, as we will see later. Uh, and this is a critical post-CPA dynamics. And um, another critical uh, aspect that we have noticed that the other armed groups, I'm talking about these, uh, I hope you all know more or less the Sudan contest, but the other armed groups that were militias, um, that had been used by the parties during the war. The other MARA groups should have been disarmed and reintegrated in the armies after the CPA. That has not happened fully. Officially, it has happened, but we have seen an increasing militarization of militias along the border. More, more dramatically, the tribal militias are fractioned within, so it's very difficult to understand which direction those allegiances can take, and that affects... Uh, first of all, the, the, border, uh, the border areas. We have also seen um, um, clashes, witness clashes between SPLA and tribal militias are, as uh, was happening during the war, in particular in the um, Bar al-Ghazal and Unity and central areas, the Unity, the unity areas. More peaceful is, the, is the, the Upper Nile Peak. And we have identified also cross-cutting um, dynamics that we have called conflict drivers, but are also findings that affect the stability of the border in the months and in the year to come. First of all, the referendum of, of self-determination for South Sudan that has created the problematic of the border. And so it's playing around all the other dynamics we, have, we, are, we are talking about. Border demarcation is a problem in relation to the 
land disputes and lack of effective mechanisms to address the land issues. Um, in some cases, as we will see, the border demarcation, the clarity of the map doesn't entail stability of the border. There is a problem, an actual problem of the ground, of demarcating the border, because there is a lack of understanding of land use and ownership, different perception of land use and ownership, for instance, between the Masiria and, um, and the Dinka and the Nuer, and that creates local conflicts on the ground that no mechanism are able to, to address. The land commission, the state land commission in the south and in three areas after the CPA have been formed. Some have not even been formed, but they are not functioning. And um, the police in the state is the creation of the former um, soldiers, especially in the south. And we can't really say that it's completely objective. And the judiciary is very weak. So there is a lack of effective uh, system to address land disputes. Uh, some of the people interviewed on the border, they said that they would have, first of all, um, tried to solve the, the land problems legally, and, uh, and uh, in the case that was not possible, they would have recurred to fighting. Um, the problem of conflict around the border derives from a conflict over natural resources, in particular oil, minerals, and agriculture. Oil is the major driver of conflict around the border, and uh, in particular in the area of Iglij, which is in the border between South Ekotofan and Unity State. Um, minerals are present along the border uh, in the area of Kafia Kinji, in, in, uh, in Blue Nile, and agricultural schemes are um, resources of Upper Nile. This is a very sketchy uh, presentation of the natural resources, but it, it shows that the importance, the strategic importance that some areas um, um, around the border uh, represent for the parties. Um, <coughs> militarization and community security is a is an increasing dynamic. As I said at the beginning, militarization uh, meaning that parties, SAF and SPLA, have redeployed along the border, and there is a massive presence of arms and weapons among the civilians, but also uh, within the soldiers themselves. And some of the insecurity that has been, um, that has generated after the elections, for instance, was coming from soldiers, defectors, that have arms and, and use it. And uh, as the Community Security Bureau and DDR admit, SAF and SPLA do not have the control of the arms around the border. Migration is a very important dynamic around the border, but contrary to what we think, is not a spread problem all over the border. This, this research was about identifying um, and localize issues to identify specific intervention because we cannot address the border as a big general problem. There are specific conflicts that can be addressed with um, specific solutions to reduce their potential, and migration is one of them. Uh, there are good relations between nomads in the Upper Nile Peak, in Blue Nile, and in other areas. The problem of migration entails the Masiria and the Rizegat uh, descending from Southern Kordofan and Southern Fur, respectively, as we will see later, and impacting in the grazing area of Southern Sudan, and is only present in those areas where there is uh, there has been um, unmet expectation and narrowing of the grazing routes due to the oil and to the war. I will explain that better. The three, th three transitional areas are a, are a very important conflict driver in the months to come. Um, the, t the problem of the transitional areas has not been solved by the CPA. The transitional areas have taken different developments. Um, the CPA has defined, um, has set for the, an ABA, a referendum to happen in ABA area, as I think I take that for, for granted, but we, we will discuss about it later as well. And um, Popular consultations to be held in the South of Kordofan and South of Blue Nile. 
the delay of the lack of full implementation of the CPA and the delay of the elections, the national elections from the fourth year of the interim period to a few months ago, has um, postponed the, the definition of the popular consultations problem and therefore linking the, the, the result of popular, the, the process of popular consultation to the South and Sudan referendum. And this is a very critical dynamic that was not foreseen by the CPA draft, drafter. Moreover, South of Kordofan popular consultation will happen after the South Sudan referendum, whereas Blue Nile popular consultation will happen hopefully in December if everything goes as expected. And that creates different dynamic between the two. The interplay between the, 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 the process in one area and in the other one is, is, a, is a risk for stability. Citizenship is a, is a major problem that is now being addressed by the parties and uh, has not been solved by the CPA. The citizenship problem entails, for instance, the, the um, fate of the SPLA soldiers in the north and the SAF soldiers in the south. Um, the returnees, we have seen an increased dynamic in the upper Nile peak where returns are prevented and there is a great fear of um, southern unionists resettling in the south and affecting the referendum option. One thing I haven't said before is that the referendum on self-determination is not exactly a free decision of the people of southern Sudan. We have seen a lack of critical thinking, especially around the borders, the border in the areas we have, we have visited, whereby people have links, close links to the population in the north. And they take, they, 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 they don't even consider the option of unity, but when you talk about them and the implication of separation, they, they clearly haven't thought about all the possibilities, including possible hard border that will block the routes of goods from between the north and the south. Um, all, the almost majority of, of the trade uh, happening in the border areas is conducted by uh, northern uh, traders. Um, northern traders interviewed in Unity State, for instance, have admitted that in December they will go north back to the Gedare for Khartoum, wherever they come from. And that will create a great gap for the people in, in southern Sudan. Mm -hmm. and, um, and those are all issues that need to be addressed. In the, the, the idea of the CPA demarcation was that the demarcation of the north-south border should have happened in the pre-interim period. That has not happened. And that has had a great impact on key CPA benchmark. As I said before, the redeployment of the troops, SAF and SPLA, has happened in contested areas. And that has increased the national mistrust and militarization in those areas. And uh, today, with five months left before the referendum, parties disagree on the importance of the demarcation of the north-south border for the referendum to happen. According to the NCP, the referendum depends on the demarcation of the border. For the SPLM, this is not a prerequisite for the referendum to happen. The SPLM is firm in saying that the referendum has to happen the 9th of January 2011. Um, the border committee has submitted um, a recommendation to the presidency of the board uh, on the, the the border, the assessment of the north-south border, and they, they have identified, they say, 80% of non-contested areas and 20% of contested areas. But it's very unclear what this 20% means. And, uh, and the disagreement is between five or four areas uh, uh, along the border. The approach of Concordis has been to understand what are the conflict-prone areas affected by <coughs> local dynamics. What is the perception of the people? Some of the areas, even if they are not contested, they have problematic on the ground, and they will be contested in, in the moment of demarcation. 
And we have also tried to understand the internal state dynamics and their effect on the border, on the border stability. And that will be in the report much better analyzed. Today, I want to give you a sketch of the, of the conflict-prone priority areas that we identified on the border. Again, this is not a, a demarcation uh, report at all. We just want to give a better understanding of facts, a report of facts that we have assessed on the ground. So I would start from, from the west. The first contested areas is the area between South Darfur and Western Bar al Ghazal. Uh, some people call it Raja area, but this is imprecise because Raja is part of the south and that has not been defined yet. Uh, we call it uh, by the names of the major cities, Kafia, uh, villages, Kafia Kinjis and Ofra al Nas. Uh, this area is, is a no man's land, uh, a stateless area contested between South Darfur and Western Balagazai, given to South Darfur in the 60s and never returned back. Even though the Addis Ababa agreement had, had um, had uh, decided that the areas belong to the South and should have been returned, but that, that has not happened. And the same dynamic is happening today. There is no willingness from the, south of, from the side of the North to return the area to the South, but the um, Gauss has taken an assertive politics um, and has occupied, has not occupied, is not, has entered the area. So the, the danger dynamic in this uh, enclave is that both SPLA and SAF are present, and that um, combines with increasing militarization and uh, possible uh, presence of other armed groups uh, from uh, international countries, and, and depends very much on the increasing militarization of South Darfur. So the national contestation leads to militarization, and uh, the potential of the area the area is known for having an economic potential, copper and uranium. And in fact, those resources are not really used by anyone. So there is a lack of, uh, um, uh, like, missed revenues and opportunities, both at the state and the national level. And, um, and this area needs to be monitored because um, it's, it's, uh, it can be a risk both to log local and national, and national stability in case uh, national dynamics change. And uh, a recent conflict dynamic which I witnessed, we have witnessed was a conflict between SPLA and South Darfur tribes. There is a gap in the area. There is a new, dy is a new dynamic that has never happened before. Just to say that how insecurity in the north can affect also dynamic along the border. The second area that is related to this one is still bordering South Darfur is the northern Bar al Ghazal. It's called the Safaha area. As you see in the map, is the 14 miles area south of the, uh, of the Bar al uh, Arab or Kir river. It's contested, this, this dynamic is between the social, the difference between social and administrative boundaries. The area was, in 1924, was given to uh, to the north to allow for migration of Miseria and Rizigat from the north in the area. And um, after the CPA has been signed, the SPLA has entered the area, again, on the, on the idea that the border is the river itself and, uh, and has provoked restrictive access to the northern tribes. But the issue has been solved, and that is a positive, positive example has been solved thanks to the um, capacity and history also of the governor of Northern Bar Ghazal and the support, in, the support of the government of Southern Sudan to solve uh, uh, issues with the um, and, and historical relation with the, with, the, with the Northern tribes. There have been two major conferences in 2008 to 2010 with the two tribes, and so far the situation is holding. However, the increasing instability in South Darfur and South Kordofan is a threat to the stabi local stability uh, created by these agreements. Um, South Kordofan unity. <coughs> this is potentially the major uh, conflict risk uh, along the north-south border. Um, as you see, the, the area 
north of unity, as you see in the map, is contested. In particular, the, the, the villages of Iglij and Karasana up to the Kailak in southern Kordofan are claimed by people of unity, Pariang County, which is the northern county in unity state. The issue has been determined, has been, um, determined mainly after the PCA ruling of ABA that has narrowed down the area. You can see, Chris will explain better ABA later. It has, as you see, the, the, the rectangle next on the left of this, of this uh, arrow. ABA, as ABA PCA ruling has narrowed down the area of ABA, and that has left Higlij in a sort of uh, territorial dilemma, whereas the, the NCP believe that the PCA ruling automatically gave Iglij to South Godofan, the people in unity say that the issue has not been solved and therefore it should be, it should be resolved within the presidency. Uh, it is an, an, an issue between oil and the land about stable resources and mobile resources across the border. Um, who has the who has the land ownership over the oil in the area? Iglij is one of the major oil fields in Sudan. Even though its capacity is reducing vis-à-vis uh, -vis an increasing capacity of the Melut Basin in, um, in Upper Nile, it is still an important, um, an important symbolic issue as well. And uh, when we asked people also in Abia, in, in, uh, in Bentiu, in the Parian County in Unity State, like, would you renounce to Iglij for the sake of Southern Sudan stability? They, they say no, because this is our land. And uh, this different perception of the land between the um, border communities is also due to national uh, mistrust and the fact that the border between the north and the south after the referendum can become uh, a closed border. And uh, the increasing militarization show that um, the descent of the nomads, like the mass Syria nomads, is more difficult. In the last two years, mass Syria coming from the north have been impeded entering in some of the localities of unity uh, because they were carrying arms. And um, mass Syria, on the other hand, they don't want to disarm to enter the state because they don't trust security capacity of, of unity state. And um, what we have to say about unity and South Dakota Fund State, there is an, a lack of capacity or commitment to address conflicts. Um, as opposed to Northern Bar al Ghazal situation seen before, the situation in these states between Unity and South Dakota Fan is problematic and, problematic and not prob properly addressed. It's not a lack of um, reconciliations and efforts, it's a lack of um, implementation of the recommendations, lack of state capacity and commitment to uh, give compensations and address the problem. Uh, ABA area, I think Chris will, uh, okay. will talk about it. Yeah. Thanks, Benedetta. Before I say something about the ABA area, I think um, I may risk repetition a touch, but I'd like to just inject at this point a little bit of explicitly the community perceptions that were offered to Concordis International um, through our workshops and through... Um, this period of field research. Um, so I think it's worth emphasizing that the populations of you know, Northern Unity State um, first have uh, deep concerns about the land ownership issue. The Dinka Pano who are living essentially in this top triangle of uh, Unity State just north of Bentu um, perceive themselves to have been squeezed southwards in uh, numerous successive waves of displacement since the 1960s, 1964. Um, their primary concern is uh, the ability to resettle in the land which is currently um, in Hedgelidge and Karasana inside this contested area. Um, 
They're extremely concerned that they haven't been consulted by the Border Demarcation Committee, despite claiming that they have customary knowledge, uh, particularly in institutions of the traditional authorities, as to where uh, the border was in 1956, um, the date outlined in the CPA um, for uh, the line of the north-south border. So we have a primacy of local interests. I mean, many of the, many of the administrators in Northern uh, Unity State were members of the SPLA during wartime. Many of them expressed that they joined the, the, uh, the movement because of local concerns. They went to Ethiopia to pick up a weapon, not because they had a belief in a national revolutionary struggle or a vision for New Sudan. First and foremost, it was to do with preventing cattle raiding from what they perceived to be an aggressive um, nomadic communities. So I think it's really worth underlining the primacy of uh, local interests. Um, and the same thing, some of the nomadic communities who were involved in um, the conflict, the conflicts in Sudan, you know, would have reportedly negotiated with the uh, with SAF to restrict their um, restrict their sphere of operation to areas which concerned their migration routes. So again, they were fighting part of a national picture, but they were fighting to guarantee their local concerns. Um, but basically, in this area, we, we find that it, the same issue is in place for the Bull, Nua, and Dinkai law in Western Northern Unity State. And they, uh, they have similar perceptions. They will not be satisfied well, they say they will not be satisfied unless they can resettle land which is currently uh, in a contested area. So the point here that we're trying to bring out is that a national agreement um, does not necessarily, um, will not necessarily satisfy the interests of local actors. And there's a, hi a history of fragmentation, history of factionalization in this area does mean that there is a potential for, for local actors to, um, to compete for for what they see as local interests and to destabilize the, the local region and draw in national conflict actors. Um, so in this area, communities say that the uh, conflict mitigation mechanisms have almost completely um, collapsed. Um, and despite stressing a history of cooperation. So um, in, it's important also to defragment some of these nomadic communities in particular. Um, and this is something that southern communities are, are quite good at doing. Um, they acknowledge that there's not a, a mass, not every single uh, member of a nomadic community is a threat to their security. And indeed, when I, when I was in Abyei, um, there was a, a delegation of Misseria came to Abyei town uh, and said, we, you know, we're not part of the instability that's moving in northern Abyei. We would like to open some dialogue about the border issue there. Um, but ultimately, these communities are saying that they want clear regulatory frameworks uh, to facilitate trade and movement and peaceful coexistence uh, in this area, um, such as joint border courts um, and joint mechanisms for managing security. Um, I should briefly say something about what Misseria said um, in the Mujlad area. So this is north of the Abbey area. Um, and their primary concern was yeah, the potential internationalization of the border and the effect this might have on their ability to, to graze uh, in unity, Warab and Abbey. Um, and they're particularly concerned with the potential of the Abbey referendum to further reduce their access. Um, and rumors and the recent clashes in and restricted access since the CPA to Unity State and Warup State has reinforced these fears. Um, and their historical experience post Addis Abba agreement as well um, does, does little to, um, to reassure them that their grazing rights will be respected as outlined in the CPA and as outlined in the PCA ruling. Um, so the Misseria feel let down by, by the CPA. They say that they resent both the NCP for 
not recognizing their contribution during the wartime. Um, and since the CPA was signed, they say the loss of political and economic influence in Kordofan through the removal of West Kordofan State, their traditional homeland, has further marginalized them from um, national politics. And the grazing rights continue to be affected, they say, by agricultural expansion, environmental change, and wider economic changes which are diversifying livelihoods. Um, and many of those who were former fighters have since the CPA lost some of the benefits of the war economy, um, which have not been replaced by employment opportunities and alternative livelihoods. So there's a huge amount of discontentment and perceptions of marginalization on both sides of the border, and both of these sets of interests will need to be addressed. Um, so briefly on, on Abye, um, I mean, the ruling of the Permanent Court of um, Arbitration in The Hague on Abye delinked the issue of oil from, um, from implementation of the Abye Protocol. Um, but the importance of the Abye area is, is not diminished. It really created an additional problem of hedgelage uh, to one side. Um, and in the context of national negotiations on wealth sharing and uh, territory and citizenship and other issues for the post-referendum period, um, Abye remains a significant um, issue on the table. Um, it's a, the Abye referendum itself... Uh, is a potential trigger for conflict, either if it occurs or if it's delayed. Um, various Misuria groups um, have reportedly armed themselves, both in northern Abia and, and further north. Uh, some of these are independent. Some of these are some of these are independent and resent, have resentment towards the south and and the northern governments. Some are aligned with SAF and some are um, have joined the SPLA. But either way, a um, large group of Misuria have said that if they are not able to participate in the referendum, then they will uh, be willing to destabilize the process. Um, and there has been, again, this is not taking Misuria as a whole, but those statements have been made by a number of groups in various all Misuria congresses. So in terms of the ABA referendum, we have other exacerbating issues. Um, the, the resettlement of Dinkanok into Abye is, is accelerating, um, and the Abye administration has a plan to resettle these groups in the northern half of Abye, where there are a number of Misuria residents. Um, and at the same time, reportedly, uh, a huge number of Misuria are planning to also resettle in the same area. So conflict, local conflict over land and uh, in the context of high tensions could easily spill over into violence um, around the referendum period. So I think that's all I'd like to say about Abye, and I'll uh, pass it over to Benedict. So we continue the... Sorry the presentation and we finish also with the Upper Nile area. Um, the Upper Nile area has four areas of disagreement that we have um, um, found on the ground and also correspond to the national, some of them to the National Border Committee finding. The, the first area on the left is the Kaka area on Manio County, and on the top, bordering South Korofan and White Nile, is the, uh, the Meganis Mountain. The, the issue is, mo is, is similar here, like the um, northern nomads have been settled in the areas um, in, the, in the last century, and they, have, they are used to live there. There is no clear disagreement about the maps, in particular in Kaka area, but there is a practical problem of settlement and use of resources from the south of northern, northern uh, communities. And uh, <coughs> this is due also to historical boundary changes like in the 20s that have given in Kaka areas access to the Nile, to the Nuba people, 
uh, but then that um, agreement has been uh, has been changed to give the area back to the to Upper Nile to the south. The exploitation of resources from the south of from the side of the northern has been um, has been a, a common um, um, finding in uh, Upper Nile, and uh, moreover, people in the south say that the the exploitation is supported by the presence of SAF and the militarization of the area. Um, there is local mistrust, and is clear also exacerbated again by the position of the Shilluk after the CPA. Shilluk live on the left side of the Nile River um, in four counties, uh, localities in um, in, up, in the Upper Nile State. Increasingly, after the CPA, there have been clashes between the Shilluk and the Dinka, where the Shilluk feel marginalized in the national context and rejected the over um, uh, extra power of the Dinka. And at the last election, the issue has been, uh, as in, the, the, the conflict, conflict has increased due to the creation of a new political party and uh, led by the former SPLA, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lama Kol, and uh, that has augmented and created further um, tribalization, ethnic, ethnic polarization in the area that is very critical. The position of the Shilluk in the referendum time is also a dynamic to monitor. The, um, the, other, the other border contested area is probably the most problematic in Upper Nile is the, the northern peak the area between Rank and White Nile. Uh, both SAF and SPLA are deployed in the line you see, the horizontal line at Jorda Wintau. I will go a bit quicker because we have a lack of time. The conflict are resource based in these areas. There is an increasing militarization and, and the problem of local community, peaceful coexistence historically that has been, um, has been damaged by the presence of SAF and SPLA. Uh, in the areas that until an agreement over the land is not found, the, 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 the mistrust at the local level um, augments and that can, can fuel into the, the national conflict quite easily. Um, last, the problem of the border between Upper Nile and Blue Nile, uh, the top area of the, 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 the triangle of, of Gulli between Blue Nile, Sinar and Upper Nile, Apparently, there is a national agreement for this area, which is an agricultural area scarcely populated, but there is a potential contestation over the demarcation on the ground and is also, um, is also supported by internal state dynamics played between Blue Nile and Upper Nile. Blue Nile, as we have said, is a transitional area that will be, um, will be holding the proper consultation process. And according to the... To the the, that process, the, 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 um, the development of the, that process and possible occupation of the, of the Blue Nile by SAF, the relation between Blue Nile and Upper Nile can, can deteriorate. Finally, the, um, e, the, the area of Shali Al-Fil in the border between Blue Nile and Upper Nile is an interesting area where by there is no disagreement over the maps, but the Udu communities in the 50s has been displaced several times and is now living along across the border. This area, there is not much talk about it. There is sort of a taboo to discuss about these issues. There is the risk that the actual demarcation on the ground, and in the case of separation of South and Sudan after the referendum, Uduk communities will want to belong to the South, and that will create local problem. And their fate will also depend on the, on the support of uh, whether the Blue Nile will be uh, uh, controlled and in what way by SAF or SPLA uh, in the months to come. Um, and this I, I said, I don't know if you want to add. Uh, no. no. So no. this is the, um, those are the major findings. And to conclude, just a few, few comments and to, to, to highlight issues that we can talk about and you will find in the report. The national agreement cannot, be, cannot preclude local interest. Um, the, the negotiations between the parties, the post, 
2011 referendum negotiations. Unfortunately, they don't include discussion on the board on the pre-referendum dynamics, including the ABA voters, the popular consultation, and the north-south border. So the CPA outstanding issues are not discussed, and there is no much clarity over the process, and people on the ground feel the gap between them and their, and their leaders, both in Khartoum and in Juba. So whatever agreement is coming out from the parties, and now the recent, uh, the recent uh, meeting uh, within the presidency on the 29th of August, that the marcation will, of the contest, non-contested areas will start immediately, has to be uh, discussed as to involve the local actors. One of the suggestions would be formation of state border committees to work alongside the national border committees involving local population. Um, the other major message that we can give at the end is like we cannot tackle the border issue as a big, big problem, but we need contextualized actions and, uh, and as soon as possible to reduce the potential of conflict of the area. Thank you. Martin to make some comments, and I think it's better if you come to the podium. Thank you, Andrew, for the, the invitation to participate in this seminar this afternoon. And I'd like to begin by congratulating Concordis and International and its researchers on an informative, challenging, sometimes rather sobering, but ultimately very constructive report. And I when you have the opportunity to read it, I would certainly try to find some time to digest the, the findings and recommendations that are included in it. My brief for this afternoon is not to comment directly on the report. There are, there are elements of the report that I would speak about, I guess, during the discussion session, but my, I was asked today to talk a little bit about the, the wider context of international boundary making and the challenges of cross-border management. And so I'm just going to make a few general points um, and perhaps touch on one or two elements of the, the report's findings which, which resonate because I suppose my first thought is the challenges facing Sudan in the establishment of, of a border of whether it's an international border, a harder internal border within a, within a unified state um, are not unique. Many of the findings of the report are things that we who spend our, our lives looking at international boundaries see over and over again around the world. And boundaries can be a challenge not just for states that are emerging from, from conflict uh, deal, and states which are dealing with poorly defined colonial boundaries, but they can be a challenge even for long-established states with good, good relations. It might surprise you that very few of the world's international boundaries are perfectly defined. And by perfectly defined, I mean they are delimited in an unambiguous way. In other words, there is a clear legal definition that allows that boundary to be described, either through geographical coordinates or maps or, or some form of description. Very few are defined unambiguously, and even fewer are clearly marked on the ground um, so that the inhabitants of border areas know where, where they are. But even where you do have a clear delimitation and appropriate demarcation for the landscape through which the border runs, that doesn't guarantee that the boundary is going to be a success. Delimitation and demarcation are only the start of the boundary making process. It's important firstly to maintain a boundary if it is marked on, on the ground so that it doesn't become blurred and contested. And all too often in Africa, this is what we have seen. Boundaries were originally marked to some extent on the ground, but over time, lack of maintenance has meant that the, the boundary has become fuzzy and that very often leads to disputes down the line. But even more important than maintenance is the management of a boundary. The, the approach that neighboring states take towards the boundary and the border. And I, I distinguish the boundary, which is the, the legal line, and the border and the border land which surrounds it. They, they're somewhat different concepts, and I'm happy to discuss in, them in more detail during the discussion. But what you do with the border once it has been established is the critical thing in determining whether it will be a success. 
And the, the main challenge for any pair of neighboring governments is to develop a cooperative management regime that both meets the requirements of the states and, as far as possible, doesn't infringe on the rights, aspirations, and legitimate interactions of the inhabitants of the border area. Bernadette mentioned the, the sense of marginalization among the populations of the border states of the, the north-south border. Um, and this is very, very common around the world, that people in border areas, geographically, almost by definition, they are marginalized, but, but that politically and economically, they also feel marginalized, not involved in the process of establishing the boundary. And without their input and agreement, at least to the principles of establishing an international boundary, there is a very strong chance of failure down the line, no matter how much money and technical resources governments throw at the process of defining the line in the first place. Unfortunately, developing a, an effective management regime is, much, is far easier said than done. I wish I could bring a ready-made model of, of board, effective border management, but even in, in the West, states struggle to, to cooperate to apply the appropriate resources, both human, um, material, and financial, to, to the problem. Management falls into a variety of categories. First and foremost, we have the question of access and security. And in some ways, they're two sides of the same, the same coin. Access management is trying to facilitate the legitimate interaction of people, goods and services, ideas flowing across borders. Security management is about preventing unwanted people, goods and ideas from crossing boundaries. All states have legitimate security interests. It's part of what makes a state and a government. Most states agree that trying to keep borders as open as possible is also desirable, but it's often very difficult to reconcile the desire for openness with the need for security. There's questions of infrastructure management, and they, that applies doubly when you are dividing an existing state where the, the infrastructure of roads, um, sewerage, telecommunications were previously considered part of a single state, and suddenly you're dealing with an infrastructure that somehow ne potentially needs to be managed by, by two states. There's resource management, and Bernadetta uh, mentioned that oil is one of the main drivers of conflict in Sudan. Also, access to water and grazing areas um, is another, another element of managing transboundary resources. It's incredible how common um, it is for natural resources to straddle international boundaries. And, of course, everybody on both sides wants to maximize their access to, to those resources. It's perfectly, perfectly normal. States should also be thinking, if possible, about managing the environment, questions of pollution, maintaining biodiversity. For some states, even issues of, of tourism in, in border areas, perhaps not so much in Sudan at the moment, but certainly environmental management is often tacked on to the, the question of what do we do about managing our borders. When it comes to developing strategies, a wide range of factors need to be taken into account. There's the history and the legal status of the, the boundary itself, which may create legal blocks to certain management approaches. Fundamentally, there's the physical and particularly the human geography of the border landscape. It's all too easy when looking at maps of remote parts of the world to forget that boundaries run through real physical and human landscapes. And People's lives are affected by, by these, these lines. And I come here as a geographer, and what I, I usually do in, in presentations on this kind of thing is, is provide a long list of reasons why geographical expertise is important in boundary making and border management. I will just make, that, make it as a simple statement now. But we are dealing with real landscapes, and the better we understand those landscapes, particularly the human landscape, um, but also particularly in areas where there are complex river systems, as there are along much of the north-south Sudan border, the physical landscape is very important as well. National and regional political priorities obviously have to be taken into account, as do the relations across the either existing or potential boundary. And the available resources, it's 
all well and good coming up with a wonderful border management plan, but if you don't have the people, the, the technical resources, and particularly the, the financial resources to implement those plans, they are bound to, to fail in the long run. Whatever strategy is adopted, it will affect the nature of the, the borderland. And if I can manage this, I would just want to put up a, a slide which depicts uh, four... I can't get to it. Okay, I'm perfect. Um, four types of borderland that were identified by the American historian Oscar Mar Martinez. His research was based on the Mexico-United States borderland, but I think the model is one which uh, applies to many borderlands around the world, or at least we can identify some of the issues. And he described alienated borderlands, which this is the hard border, sometimes even a physical separation of two states, with almost no borderland at all because there is very little interaction. And then we go through coexistence, interdependence, and finally integration, where there's almost complete freedom of movement across the border, and of course the borderland itself becomes broader and more dynamic as a result of increasing flows. Very few states in today's world conform to the alienated model or the integrated model. Most fluctuate somewhere between coexistence and interdependence. It's not important to say where does Sudan fit on this, um, this continuum. I simply want to suggest that the strategies that are developed will have an impact, and the, the more secure the border is, the less likely the borderland is to, to flourish. I would also suggest, and this again echoes something Bernadette has said, is that strategies for develop borderland management need, are almost certain to vary along the length of the boundary, even short boundaries, but particularly where we have 2,000 kilometers, as we do in the case of the North-South Sudan border. Um, the different physical, human, political, cultural contexts mean that different local approaches may be needed. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. There is an initiative taking place across the African continent known as the African Union Border Program. Some people here may be familiar with it. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it later on. But the vision of this program is to turn Africa's borders into, into bridges, not barriers. Um, when I sit at meetings relating where this vision is repeated frequently, um, I often think it seems rather fanciful. But it is important to remember that while borders can, can be and, and certainly are in the, in the context of Sudan sources of, of friction and even conflict, there are also lines where people meet, trade, and exchange information ideas. They are dynamic, vital, and sometimes creative features of our, of our landscapes. Border areas are often misunderstood and feared by central elites, and therefore they tend to get treated with a heavy and sometimes clumsy hand. And while it is clearly desirable to maintain peace and security in border areas, uh, attempts to eliminate all potential sources of friction are likely to be counterproductive and push us towards the alienated borderland model. But having said that, of course, it is possible to think of, of scenarios in which... Um, for example, demilitarized zones along particular contested sections of border may be established. Um, demilitarized zones, neutral zones, international zones have all been tried around the world with varying degrees of success over the years. Um, the key element in ensuring that they're, they're successful is uh, political will and competent administration, and those are not, all, not always readily available. There are models within Africa um, where there are zones of shared grazing rights, um, and uh, in particular, a 1970 border agreement between Ethiopia and Kenya established uh, a regime for, for transboundary grazing rights. These, these, the details of these agreements are often overlooked because they tend to be included in appendices to rather dry, dry treaties, but they're... There are models out there that, that can be looked at in terms of managing access to resources and also for bringing borderland communities together. We heard in, we see in the report examples of local initiatives to try and resolve local differences, and I think that is a crucial element 
of any, any form of boundary making and border management approach. And I think I'll stop there because I'm sure we're going to have a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Benedetta and Chris for a detailed look at what's in the report and, and very much to Martin for that uh, broader perspective, which I think is quite important. Um, we do have some time for, the, for questions. If you do have questions, please come to the microphone. It's USIP's normal practice to give the first opportunity for question or comments to representatives from the embassy or to the mission. Mr. Ambassador, if you would like to make a comment. Uh, the microphone is. Thank you, Mr. Blum. Thank you, USIP. And uh, I would like to congratulate the presenters for the informative presentation they have made and uh, which was my view as fair as could be. I come from Southern Sudan. Uh, I think many of you might have noticed. <laughs> uh, and I represent the government of national unity. So my comments will be very limited. <laughs> but uh, I have lived in some parts of the areas of conflict. I lived in Kaka in 1986, and I've seen the spillover of the conflict, especially among the communities. Uh, and while I was there, there were communities from the <coughs> south of the fan that had some understanding <coughs> with the Shiluk population around Kaka. Some of them would come during the dry season, uh, collect what we used to call gum Arabic. I now call it gum Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> this is not to be biased to anybody because there will be different uh, nomenclature in southern Sudan. Uh, and they would exchange some grain with uh, the population there. I mean, there was harmony uh, in the relations. And I would not say that of uh, Abiyé, although I know that long ago, uh, Paramount Chief Deng Majuk had some good understanding uh, with Paramount Chief Babo Nimir uh, in terms of managing uh, their community relations in sharing water <coughs> and other resources. So the Miseria would come around the Kir, uh, that border, with their animals. At that time, our equipment, the war, the war weapons we had were not uh, so destructive as the ones we have today, the collection cough and the GM3. Uh, and so people could come with their weapons. There was no problem. There was uh, no conflict after the grazing period was over. So the Messiria would go back and, and come the next year, people celebrating. The Dinka would go to Messiria land. They would be welcome, and they would stay where it was wet in southern Sudan. Apparently, things have changed. I hope and wish that as God has put us to live together in this area, we need to manage ways and means to continue to live, whether there is uh, separation as an outcome of the referendum or there is unity. Because even today, we are one country, and yet 
we have some conflict. So I only hope for the proper management, uh, which is the concern and interest of all the political leaders from both sides of uh, the border. So I only hope and pray that we arrive at this uh, solution. I have no particular uh, recommendation to make, but I, it is just the wish. And unless one of my uh, staff would want to add a comment, because this might not be fully uh, representing uh, my embassy view, then I would ask uh, Your Excellency if you may want to make a comment. No more comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you do have a comment, begin to make your way uh, to the microphone. Um, please um, let us know who you are. And if you have somebody in particular uh, you'd like to ask the question to, please let us know. Despite the, uh, the challenges of our camera in the back, um, I'm going to uh, ask the panel uh, to, stay, to stay seated. Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Uh, Peter Dixon with Concordis International. I would just like to take this opportunity not only to thank the United States Institute of Peace for allowing us to do this work and enabling this work to happen, but as importantly to emphasize what this report is and is not. Um, what it is not is a, um, a report by a think tank or even an advocacy, advocacy group providing neat policy solutions or demands. That's not what we've been trying to do. It's a very focused report trying to unpack the issues and drivers of conflict in the border areas in order to inform and assist future conflict um, mitigation, resolution, and even transformation uh, in, in Sudan's future. So just, I, I would just like to be very clear about that and to thank USIP for allowing us to do this work. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Please. That actually answered part of my question, but um, my name is Lisa Freeman. I'm from the Alliance for Peacebuilding, and I was just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about the methodology mm -hmm. you use to mm -hmm. conduct the analysis, and does um, Concordis use a specific framework for conflict assessment? And then often it does seem that there is a disconnect between really excellent analysis like this and then translating it into strategies for peace building. So who's the target audience and what do you hope that they'll do with it? Thank you very much. I'll respond to that. So we actually use a hodgepodge of different strategic conflict assessment um, techniques. But the basic principle was multidisciplinary, so bringing in uh, people who had expertise in um, economics, political science, history, um, and uh, obviously Sudan. Um, but broadly, you could say we followed something like different strategic conflict assessment model. Um, but we didn't, as Peter said, really take it to the next uh, level and look at detailed recommendations in the report. Um, however, the, the audience is, uh, is both Sudanese policymakers who may find this of use in considering challenges in their country um, and also the international donor community who are doing a relatively good job of attempting to coordinate their responses to these challenges. Um, but the, the policy definition and generation is, is, um, is left to others to a great extent, and we're trying to signpost um, priority areas and issues. And the work from I just add, the, the recommendations that are coming out of the Concordis Cross Border Relations Project, on the other hand, are specifically aimed at informing specific forums um, in Sudan, um, including the uh, negotiations on post referendum arrangements, uh, including the Border Governors Forum, the Tamazuch process, um, including the African Union's mediation efforts, 
um, and, in, and including um, bodies like the South Sudan Referendum Task Force and the National Constitutional Review Commission in, in uh, Khartoum. And those recommendations have, are being, we have additional resources to develop those recommendations into implementable mechanisms um, to achieve the kind of models that the border communities are talking about. Um, so there is a distinction between Concordia's broader work and the functions of this report. Obviously, we hope it would also inform uh, USIP's forthcoming grant-making program. And it's an interesting question because we actually talked quite a bit about whether there should be sort of clear recommendations in this report. And our, our conclusion at the end of it was those recommendations aren't often worth all that much. And we asked instead for sort of Concordus to show their work, educate us, um, and then sort of we'll, we'll take it from there, those of us who are able to implement projects. Um, because a lot of times I believe those, those recommendations in, in reports are, are sometimes quite facile. Please. My name is Marcus Squino. I'm with <coughs> the U.S. Department of State. Um, I think there is a tendency sometimes, uh, certainly not by this panel, but others when the border is viewed to really see it as a, a conflict between nomadic tribesmen, um, the Rizigat or the Miseria, and settled people, whether it's the Dinka or the Nuer or others. Um, I think one point that, that was made uh, by Bernadetta is that indeed um, there are areas of, of the border where it is interfactional uh, by different groups within the South, and whether that's the uh, Dinka and the Shilik or, or others, um, certainly in the last year what one has seen in southern Sudan has been a dramatic increase in interfactional fighting. Um, so my question really is, as you look at drivers of conflict, um, looking at those interfactional uh, flashpoints, what do you see, um, particularly if there is a vote for independence um, after the referendum? How important are they? And just any, any thoughts on mitigation and what has worked in, in the past, say, year or, or so? Uh, it's, a very, it's a very good point. And in the report is the internal state dynamics are analyzed in detail, but we didn't have time here. And one of the, the, faction, the factionalists within Southern Sudan, um, former other armed groups, for instance, the SSDF, uh, some of the generals in the SSDF have uh, allied with SAF and some with the SPLA and they still maintain control, territorial control, sometimes very limited one, or the sub sub-clan of the new air, extremely limited, but they still they still have, ever, still have an impact, and that has happened after the elections with generals like George Ator, David Yayo, and John Gray. Um, even Galwa Gai in, um, in unity, in unity states, due to um, unmet expectation, political expectations after the CPA, so the CPA has generated political and not military expectations, but it, have not been met, and therefore there is an increasing factionalism, as you said, and um, is a serious conflict uh, risk along the border, in particular in unity and upper Nile state, we think. One of the dynamics we see, there, is, there has been within upper Nile region, which comprises unity, upper Nile, and jungle, a massive intervention in jungle state, whereas um, upper Nile state has been considered a peaceful one and no, new dynamics are emerging, and there is a lack of intervention there. The Shilluk and Dinka conflict has been um, addressed recently by the new formed state in Upper Nile. The governor is a Nuer, the deputy governor is a Maban, and they, that, this, is, this is seen as a positive um, development mm. and from the past, and they might be able to neutrally addressed the Dinka Shilu conflict. And the Peace Commission is also addressing that. Generally, the peace commissions in the state are quite weak and not functioning properly, and they follow the governor. In unity state, that is quite clear. There is a collusion between the government and, and the conflict resolution capacity leading to a failure of, of intervention. There are uh, many, uh, we have not many, sorry, few, good local organization, youth, 
in particular that have intervened in uh, Upper Nile, uh, a Shiluk, Shiluk Youth Organization, NUER, um, also supported by international organizations that are quite good. But of course, it's not at the level of the needs of intervention. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Mike Santos. I'm with the Peace and Conflict Resolution Program at American University. And my question is relatively simple. Um, at the national level, I feel um, increased border integration can have a lot of benefits, but uh, as is the case with the European Union. Um, however, in what ways do you think that increased border integration can make local populations feel marginalized? How can increased integration make local populations feel more marginalized? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, it's a good question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. It's, it's, I th it's, it's not something that you've considered in the great detail. Um, I think because the benefits of <coughs> cooperation have been very clearly expressed by um, all those that we've met in the border lands um, and the desire for peaceful coexistence and the benefits that freedom of movement and goods and access to services um, and access to individuals on each side of the border can bring. Um, do, do you want to... Respond, or maybe you have a, an idea. Probably. This is <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm not sure I, yeah. I fully understood the question because m my premise would have been that increased in, oh, if mm. I, yeah. if I was putting it, I would say increased integration in, in borderlands would help people to feel less marginalised rather rather than the more marginalised. So perhaps I didn't quite understand what you were, were driving at. Could, do you want, could, would you have yeah. another another go at framing the question? Could be, sorry. Could be a really interesting. Um, well, for example, at the national level, um, the dissolution and the integration of borders between um, places like Germany and Denmark um, at the national level had a lot of economic benefits, but locally, a lot of people, especially along the Danish coastline, have felt marginalized by um, German migrants. So I was just saying, in the Sudan, in, in what ways do we see situations like that manifested? Does that make a little more sense? Yeah, I mean, does the yes. does the integration, who's sort of threatened or maybe fearful within the border communities? What have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. Sort of maybe from the from the workshops, for instance. Um, one aspect that may be relevant is the is the uh, perception of particularly southern communities in these areas of settling of uh, nomadic communities in what is perceived to be their land. Um, and that in principle, they welcome normally the idea that um, anybody can live within their territory. Um, but then I suppose in that case, there are suspicions that once settlement has taken place, further claims may follow um, regarding land. And that's a concern we've um, we've heard of. I don't. I th I have to say that I th all the perceptions that we have heard stress the potential benefits of of integration at the borderlands. And I, nothing's coming, you know, up to the surface at this moment that would that would uh, that I can offer. Um, I was thinking. That no. Okay, next, yeah, next question, please. I mean, I think that's telling. I think what they're hearing is telling in regard to that question. Please. Yeah, my name is Emmanuel Abba. I'm from uh, Sudanese American from Phoenix, Arizona. And we're having a border issue there. In the <laughs> South. Uh, uh, so I see a lot of uh, Mexican people who are claiming that Arizona, Texas, and California is their land. So what step that has been taken in the Sudan border issue to avoid this kind of uh, 
complex? Is there any step in making corporate this kind of complex in the future? At the national level, well, that's probably the the, prob the main problem that uh, we are talking about the north-south border or the international borders. The, the international borders is, uh, well, uh, I'm not an expert on the international borders. What um, the issue between, there is a particular issue between the Kenyan and the southern Sudan borders on the eastern equatorial side. That is, is, this is a contested and not yet addressed area. And in the post-referendum negotiations, um, there is a, 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 work, a working group dealing also with the, with those international treaties and relations, but I don't think specifically addressing the international border issue, which is still within the presidency, but I don't want to say to be mistaken, but um, yeah, there isn't uh, agreements such as good cooperation agreement like for grazing rights with international borders like between the Nuer and Ethiopia, I think have not yet been uh, discussed mm. or for our knowledge, to our knowledge, but uh, there the, the must be, there must be. Things we said about the north-south border are also relevant for the international borders, yes, definitely. definitely. For example, there's certainly some cross-border cooperation um, around smuggling issues between <laughs> Upper Nile and um, Ethiopia. <laughs> and um, they are, they're involving, uh, it's a state-level state, state uh, cooperation mechanisms, regular monthly meetings. Um, but again, I don't know the details of that. Uh, it's a very porous border, the international yeah. one, with the Central African Republic and other. It's very, probably won't be demarcated either soon. Come over here. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, John Gates. I work for NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, last September, a year ago, I was asked by the, um, the Office of the Special Envoy to make a trip uh, to Sudan um, to see if I could help both parties in the implementation of the four points that were decided on the PCA. Um, so I made this, you know, several-day trip uh, down to Khartoum and, and Juba and met with both sides. And um, because I've been, been involved in border demarcation in Latin America before and, and worked with the State Department, um, with some difficulty I met with both sides but not in one room. And we talked about kind of the technical aspects of implementation of, of the uh, PCA, the four points. Um, also offered at that time, you know, what other things the U.S. government could, could bring to bear as far as satellite imagery and GIS technology and, and mm -hmm. geodetic surveys and that kind of thing that the international community could provide also. But, you know, what could the U.S. bring to bear? Um, but it was with great difficulty that I actually, you know, met with, met with both parties and tried to eke out some of the information um, that we could bring back and, and form a plan. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that, um, just a comment, um, that I've heard before is this, they have 80 percent of it figured out and there's only 20 percent. Just based on, you know, the experience I've had in the past is, it's probably not 80%. It's, you know, it's, it's a number much lower than that. And the amount of time that's going to take to actually implement this for the whole boundary will be years, if not decades. So when I looked at the kind of the initial time frame of a couple of months to put in ABIA, so, you know, they're, they're really, it's going to take a lot longer and we were getting into rainy season and all that. Um, so nothing has happened with ABIA because of the uh, security situation, lack thereof. Uh, but my question, you know, to you as a as a panel is, when you talk <coughs> to the locals, and I agree, this this has to be a, a solution that's not only comes from the national level, it has to be at the local level. What is the perception of what makes a good boundary between two states? Do the <coughs> do the Dinka feel that it has to be more of a physical manifestation? with border posts every so often and what that distance might be. Is it a fence? Um, do the Maseria think it shouldn't be anything? It just should be some numbers on a map? 
I just wanted to get your perception on that. Well, there's a rumor going around in Mujlad and Baba Nusa that um, the SPLM do, in fact, want to build a, an electric fence um, along the northern boundary of Abye on the 1010 line, which would have the capability of um, killing humans and animals. So um, there are uh, different ideas about what a border should be, uh, um, and that's obviously not one which is being presented in public by any, or in, I imagine in private by any um, uh, uh, party in Sudan. One of the fundamental basic principles for many of the southern communities is that the land ownership rights are recognized. Um, and beyond that, the boundary seem, they seem to be happy that the boundary can be you know, anything. Um, so they would be, they would welcome a very, very soft border um, uh, with customary ma management of migration routes um, if there was no challenge to that land ownership principle. Um, but if that isn't going to be uh, if they don't perceive that to be recognized, then they're very happy to promote the idea of a very, very hard border, a military border, even a wall. You know, we've, we've heard that presented. So I think the kind of border which they would uh, look to, they would advocate for, depends upon how they perceive the, you know, the other side is going to um, respond to the situation. I don't know if someone else wants to. Come in. John, I, I couldn't agree more with your, your assessment of the, the, the technical challenges that, that are likely to, to be faced. Um, but for, for me, I guess one of the, the issues that, that arises out of the whole question of, of establishing a border is what, what even at the, at the highest level is being, being expected. I mentioned in my, in my, my comments um, the need for geographical expertise, and I think that is something that was profoundly lacking when the, both the, the CPA and the ABA protocol were, were, drawn, were drawn up. I think there was a, a belief that somewhere there would be a clearly a, a lovely set of maps with the, the, 19, the, the, the boundaries between the provinces in 1956 clearly marked. Um, even more fancifully, that there, would, there was a magic map that would show the areas of the, um, the Nyok Dinka territories as they were in 1905. I mean, we literally had people coming to, to Durham where there's a, a big archive of Sudan materials saying, where's the map, the 1905 map? And it just simply didn't exist. There wasn't any geographical knowledge among the Western cartographers at the time of the areas that would make it, make it possible to, to say these are the territories of a particular group. And But based on that, that false premise that there was somehow maps already in existence, there was this notion that boundary, a boundary could be established um, relatively quickly and, um, and it wouldn't cause, wouldn't cause too many difficulties because it was a recovery exercise. This was the boundary. We can recreate it today. That's simply, simply not the case. And the CPA really provided no guidance at all to the, the people who were, were tasked with, with identifying the boundary as it was in 1956. And... I don't think a whole lot of thought has been given to the process of how to sort of fill in the gaps where existing mapping is, is not helpful. Um, and in, in general, the, the discussion is confused. I still don't know whether the, the notion of physically marking the boundary on the ground, demarcation, is what was intended when the word demarcate was used in the CPA. I can't imagine that it was. I don't know why a boundary would need to be physically marked on the ground in order to determine who gets to vote in a, in a referendum. It seems an extraordinarily complex way of going about figuring out who's entitled to vote. But the language is, has never been un disentangled. And still today, the, the technical committee is arguing over whether it, it is required to physically demarcate the boundary on the ground before a vote can, can take place. So it's a, a big problem. I think this issue of both sort of where is the boundary, but also perhaps more importantly, sort of what is the boundary is the way that both Concordus and USIP is, is approaching this issue when we're interacting with, with the local communities. I think we should have time for just two more comments. I'm sorry to the folks that 
are lined up, but please, sir. You think I should speak to this? Yes, please. There's no wire. I know. (laughs) It's a new age. (laughs) New age. We don't have that in Malakal, where I come from. I just came from Malakal, and I'm I'm still smelling Malakal. (laughs) It is uh, my name. You want my name? Sure. My name is Ezekiel Kudjok, a quillet ador. I am a reverend, a preacher in the church. Not many of them are here. But uh, I am impressed by the attendance here, which means there is a great interest in the Sudan and the problem of Sudan. I wish I have a picture of this group so that when I go to Malakal, I will show it to my group that you are not the only one dealing with your problem. There are other people. I'm a chairman or a chairperson. You don't accept men here, I think. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm a chairperson of peace reconciliation between Dinka and Shulu. And our committee is a church committee. Uh, We visited the area in the villages so that we understand why there is a conflict between Shala and Dinka. What we found, they say this conflict does not originate from them. It comes from the educated people. And they have reason why they want to make us fight one another. Uh, the, the question I want to raise is the one which has not been raised. And that is, you know, the impressive uh, presentation dealing with the question of borders between the North and the South. But now the speaker or the reporter said it's only left five months for referendum. Because now in Sudan, people are thinking about referendum. Five months left. And there are these problems on the border. They have not been settled. Are they going to affect referendum? And if they are not going, if they are going to affect the referendum, what will be the solution to prevent these problems to affect the referendum. And secondly, uh, your report, to whom is it addressed? Is it addressed to Sudan government, to to United States, or to the, to the street? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a very important question, and um, I also just came back from Malakal, so I'm... I understand, but the, um, the um, we have we have stated in the presentation a bit as well, like how the lack of border will affect the referendum. That depends on the parties. Um, as we said, the NCP wants the demarcation is as put the demarcation as demarcation as a prerequisite for the referendum, whereas the SPLM has not. New developments in the discussion between the parties have, might have changed that. But it's very, very unclear, and it's something that is happening now. Um, it's not clear. What the danger, is, the danger is that the SPLM has said that the uh, referendum has to happen the 9th of January, and because even one more day would probably delay indefinitely, and maybe the, refer- the, the conduction of the referendum and maybe will never happen. So the problem is, what will happen if the 8th of January? The border has not been demarcated. The NCP keeps insisting that the border must be demarcated. This we don't know, and this is a conflict dynamic that we should prevent. And one of the ways to prevent that, the old report is about that, how to prevent specific conflicts around the border, but to prevent the national conflict, we should definitely support and the demarcation of the border as much as possible. Parties have not requested yet support on that side, but... 
something has to be done to support like state border demarcation committees, um, security on the ground, migration uh, in the next dry season before October, and help the parties find an agreement on the contested areas because demarcation is now supposed to happen uh, for the non-contested areas. But what about the contested areas? And those are issues <coughs> that need to be to be addressed. And and who is this report uh, for? Uh, as we said, for, for everyone, when we were on the ground also, we were discussing constantly with the parties, more with the SPLM, to be honest, because it's more difficult to, to talk to the other party, but also with the Assessment and Evaluation Commission, to diplomats, to Sudanese, um, policy makers and uh, diplomats and uh, um, peace makers, university, uh, everyone. We notice a lack of knowledge of the border dynamics, so this report is to inform and say this is a problem. And uh, just can I add something to that, which is <coughs> a lack of knowledge and a lack of information. So even if a set of mechanisms are developed, either through a borders governance forum and then into the negotiations or however they come about, which could make the border work for local communities and national parties, if that information is not communicated mm. successfully um, to all the s stakeholders, then uh, it will do little to actually reduce the potential for conflict. Um, mm. So I mentioned a rumor earlier going around um, Mujlad about the electric fence. These rumors are extremely important, um, and they apply to both sides of the border. Um, and the, the Dinka in, in Bentu, they also have all sorts of rumors about how um, different misery elements are being supported in various ways by various parties or individuals. Um, and and one of the ways which it seems those kind of rumors can be, uh, or the damaging effects of those kind of rumors can be reduced is through dialogue uh, across the border. Um, and that's one way which dangers and threats of the referendum could potentially be reduced. And just to, can I add one thing? The Southern, the pe people interviewed in the South, they trust the trust mm. Goss at this stage, even People, member of opposition parties, they have moved back to the SPLM. They are supporting the SPLM because they believe it's the only party able to get to the referendum. But we also think that they believe in the SPLA and as the only, as, as, uh, only army able to, to solve the, 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 the referendum problem. The referendum is becoming a security matter, and, uh, and this is a a very dangerous dynamic. In the case the SPLM cannot guarantee the referendum to happen on time, what about the frustration of people that have fought and voted for them? And, uh, and this, we, we go back to the, to the risk of fragmentation and factionalism within those uh, communities. Final question to our neighbor. I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Um, I was wondering, since um, the how and the where of the border is still yet to be determined, um, I was wondering what role, if any, bordering states are playing or international governments are playing, or for that matter, companies, because you mentioned oil was a big um, kind of cog or wrench, <laughs> and, and what role those entities are playing in determining how the border and where the border will be defined. Uh, the Technical Border Committee has worked in the last five years and went to Egypt and England to, f to find maps, in including Durham University. Mm -hmm. uh, today, the, there is an African Union high panel that is dealing with the post-referendum talks where all international um, donors, inter uh, uh, supporters uh, converge. But the issue of the border is not directly addressed in the talks. And for, to our knowledge, the issue is, remains within the presidency. And uh, there are uh, 
there is support from uh, many people have interest in seeing the, the, the demarcation happening, including United States, and there are bilateral the talks and support in that sense. But there is a forum where the border issue is discussed together with the international community. The Assessment and Evaluation Commission, composed by UK, Norway, US, Italy, um, the Netherlands, Arab League, has just, um, has just had a meeting on the border dynamics, an informative meeting, but no decision was made there. When the international community or international actors have been invited to support the process of border demarcation, not of 1156, but of the Abia boundary. We saw a forum open up in The Hague, um, which was essentially um, the support that was requested by the parties. So there's one example of where, when asked, an international institution has, has uh, be become involved. And there is ambivalent feeling towards the intervention of internationals. Uh, there are some states, some communities that favor that some are, and see as the only option, even a military security intervention along the border being UN or AU or a, or, a, or a hybrid solution and other communities that reject that, also seeing ABA and the, the, the disconnect that has created with local communities. I think I'll bring this uh, to a close now. A couple of final uh, points of information. There are executive summaries available, if you haven't seen, on the table outside. The full report will be available for download on Concordus International's website as of tomorrow. Uh, after that, uh, it will be posted on, on the USIP website within the grant program webpage. Um, feel free to contact me if, if you have any trouble getting the full report. Um, I did want to uh, put in a mention of a future event at USAP on September 21st at 2 p.m. There's going to be an event on the role of Darfurian civil society in the Darfur peace process, which is a, quite an interesting topic these days. Uh, the panel will help launch a USI report on the subject. There's information outside as well as on our website, so that will be coming up on September 21st. Um, finally, thank you very much uh, for coming. We hope it was interesting, and thanks very much to our panel as well.